Hallelujah. Come on, why don't you give him some praise and worship this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, why don't you just raise your hands one more time and just, hallelujah, why don't you just, why don't you just bask in the presence of the Almighty God? His presence is in this place right now. He's heard our worship. He is here to meet needs. He is here to meet needs, to touch, to minister, to speak to right now. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. God, you are so good. God, you are so good. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I'm going to ask that our ushers will come prepare to wait upon us this morning. Amen, amen, amen. For those of you joining with us online, we are glad you are here. Amen. We hope to see you in person next week. Amen, amen. But we are glad that you are here with us. Amen, amen. Youth camp starts this week. I connect. Parents, youth youth camp happening this week. Amen. It will be like no other youth camp before. I can promise you that because they asked me to do things. And uh, when they ask me to do things, I'm going to make sure it's going to be something to remember. Doesn't mean it's necessarily something good to remember, Sister Dorothy, but they're going to remember it. They're going to remember it. Amen. Youth camp happens this week. Listen, parents, I need your students here at 8 o'clock Tuesday morning. All right, their luggage should be in your car right now after service. They're going to bring it into the foyer. We're going to make sure it gets up there in time. But come Tuesday morning, I need your students here at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, amen? So that bus, that van can pick them up and get them on their way. They got a four and a half, five hour drive to get there and, uh, and to Grand Junction. And so we want to make sure that we are there on time early. It's going to be a great time. Pray for us this week. Pray for us this week. Pray for me. I'm getting older and older and older, and uh, I am expected to be out till 1 o'clock in the morning hyping kids up, and um, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a struggle. Pray for Folgers. Pray for Monster and Red Bull that it gives me wings. Amen. Amen. Amen couple prayer requests real quick sister Sonia's family lost an uncle amen we want to pray for that family that God will just bring peace we don't always understand his timing we don't understand everything that takes place in in people's lives but God knows God always knows he's always there he's never left you before he's not going to leave you now he can bring comfort in the middle of a storm amen We also want to pray for Steve. This is uh, Sister Mary's um, son. Amen. He's got a physical need, and we want to pray for, for Steve as well. Amen. Let's take these needs before the Lord right now. Jesus, God, you see each and every one of the needs. Lord, those that made it on a card, God, and those that didn't. Lord, I pray right now, God, you will look across this congregation and see the needs. See the needs, God, and move, Lord, that your hand would move upon them right now, God, that you would minister, that you would touch, that you would deliver, that you would heal, God, like only you can, Lord. Let your ministering angels walk up and down these aisles, God, ministering to each and every one of us, Lord. God, we thank you for your sweet presence that we felt here this morning. God, I pray, Lord, that you will be with every single youth department making their way to Grand Junction this week, God, that you will keep your hand of protection upon them as they travel but Lord that you will meet us there in Grand Junction on that campus God and your presence will be so strong and Lord that young lives will turn they will turn their lives to you God their hearts to you God Lord and make decisions to live a life that pleases you forevermore Jesus name we pray bless this offering multiply for your kingdom in Jesus name amen amen let's sing that one more time To worship you, I live. To worship.
worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, one more time, one more time, connect with the heaven. Vivo para adorar, vivo para adorar, para adorarte Dios. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. If you feel that way, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God is good. God is in this place. Hallelujah. God is in this place. His presence is so sweet in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came to meet, to minister, to touch. I believe it, and he came to speak to us this morning. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm so glad that all the of all the reports that we're getting from ladies retreat. Amen. I was talking to mom, and she said that the Spanish side of ladies retreat was busting at the seams. That they had to open the walls and tear down walls, and you know all that kind of stuff to make room. Amen. That's a good report right there. Hungry people. Hungry people just want to hear from God. Just want to hear what the voice of the Lord says. Just want to be in His presence a little bit more. I love to hear it when walls have to be torn down. Amen. 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 Quick shout out to all our group leaders. You guys are doing a fantastic job this semester. Amen. I appreciate you. I appreciate everything that you do. I appreciate every hour that you spend, whether it's in study or whether it's in prayer for your group. Amen. You are making a difference. I'm excited to announce we had 14 in our hyphen on, uh, on Thursday night. 14 people. Amen. Guests, visitors. Amen. Some people that just finally showed up. Where you at, Alonzo? He didn't show up to second service. I'm just kidding. I'm just playing with him. Amen. But we had, uh, we had a great time in the Lord, in the presence of the Lord on, on Thursday night during our hyphen group. Listen, if you're not a part of a group, you need to be a part of a group. Let me, tell, let, me, let me ask you a question. If you know where God is moving, why aren't you there? Let's be pointed, Sister Tonya, right? If God is moving in your, in your group, they should be there in your group. Amen. Amen. God is doing great, great things in our groups all across northern Colorado. And I'm praying, listen, I'm praying for more groups next semester. But you know what that means? That means this body of Christ needs to, A, you need to sign up. We're already prepping. We're prepping for next semester. Hey, it's going to start in uh, September, October. October. She's wrong. See, I'm right. But we're already prepping for it. Why? Because we believe in what God is doing through our groups. Amen. Lives are being changed. Commitments are being made. Amen. And I am so thankful for everything that he's, he is doing. Amen. I'm going to turn your attention to the uh, Joel chapter 2. Amen. You may stay seated. I, I got a little bit of a lengthy portion of scripture. We're going to read a book real quick and uh, maybe two books and uh, then maybe we'll wrap it up. Just kidding. It's long, but we'll get there. We'll get through it. Amen. Good stuff. Joel chapter 2. How many love the book of Joel chapter 2? You all should be raising your hands. You want to know why? Here's why. Because Acts chapter 2 speaks of Joel chapter 2. You want an upper room experience? Guess what? Prophet Joel prophesied of what was coming. And Peter got up and said, hey, you remember in the Old Testament, you remember that prophet Joel, you remember how he talked about a coming day? 
when the presence and the Spirit of the Lord was going to be poured out on all flesh? Today is the day. Peter said, today is the day. You just experienced it. You want to experience it a little bit more? Just get a hold of some Bible. Get a hold of the presence of God. It's for you. It's for your children. You should love Joel chapter 2. You should go out and read Joel chapter 2. But don't worry, I'm going to read it for you. I'll let you off with a couple of verses. We'll see. Joel chapter 2, starting in verse number 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness, gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. The day is coming. Prophet Joel was in a period of time. Listen, Sister Danielle, this is what's going on, right? Here's what's going on. There was an army of the Lord of locusts. How many say locusts? Locusts. Came through the land, Sister Diana, and they wiped it all out. You want to know why the Bible spent, uses locust so much? It, it, you, you, you see it referred to time to time. Why a locust? That was smart, Sister Danielle, to sit down. I'm, I'm going to be a little while. I told you. Why locusts? Here's why. Locusts are crop killers. They consume everything. They don't leave anything behind. They, they, I'll tell you what they leave behind. They leave deserts behind. And God used them. He used them for his purpose and for his will. And so what we have in Joel chapter 2 is a time of famine, a time of desolation, a time of dryness, and a time of locusts consuming the entire land. And, and Joel describes it as a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. It was dark. There was no hope. There was no light. We're still in the Bible. Jump into verse number seven says this. Then shall run, then, I'm sorry, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they shall fall, when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the walls. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great. And for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Talking about an army of locusts. They're going to and fro from house to house. Consuming everything, Brother Dustin. Everything in their paths. Running up the walls like an army. They're not breaking rank, but they're consuming. They're not leaving a scrap of hope or just a little bit of hope. Everything in its path is being destroyed. And he goes on and he finishes that part up in verse number 11. That sa and says this, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Who's going to escape the day of the Lord? Understand. Joel is both speaking of the present time, but he's also looking into the future and giving you a glimpse, giving you a little bit of prophecy of what's to come. Heed the words of prophet Joel in chapter 2. Heed what he's saying to the people. Nobody's going to escape the day of the Lord. But verse number 12 says this, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of, of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Jumping down to verse number 18, then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people, Fear not, verse 21, fear not, O land, 
and be in, and be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain of the first month, and the floor shall be full of wheat and the vat, vats shall overflow with wine and oil and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten the canker worm the caterpillar the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied praise the name of the Lord your God that he dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be Ashamed. He gave us warning. There's coming a day, ladies and gentlemen. There's coming a day. But when that day comes, and when that day is over, He is still God in heaven. He's still on the throne. He still sees you. He still hears you. He gives us warning. Then He gives us instruction. Turn your heart. Turn your heart back to Him. Then he gives provisions and blessings. If you turn your heart back to him, here's what God's going to do. He's going to restore the years that the locusts had taken away. I'm going to preach to you this morning. There is life in the rubble. There's life in the rubble. Herodian was a castle, it was a palace built by King Herod back in the first century during his reign. Herod was famous for buildings. He built and built and built. And one of the buildings, one of the construction projects that Herod commissioned during his time was the building of this castle, this palace, this place. It was set high up on a hill in the desert of Jerusalem, the su south of, uh, in the Judean desert, south of Jerusalem. It was built high on a mountain. It was a strategic position where they could fortify and protect and provide a, a, a position of strength against enemy invaders. It was a site that was also later used as a rebel stronghold during Roman revolts that had taken place. When looking into its history, you can read and you can find how it was used throughout history at different points of uprisings and battles and warfare and turmoil. It was used as a high place, a strategic point. It had floors. It was, it was, a, it was a construction marvel of, say, uh, you might say, because of the way it was constructed, how it was constructed. They, they dug down, they buried, they, they tunneled down, they built two floors underground. You can read about it. There was two floors underground, and then it was built on top of the ground, many more floors, and they had a high wall for protection. And that's where the palace was, and that's where this castle, this strategic point, was placed. It is said and believed that King Herod was buried here in this palace. And archaeologists say it's one of the most exciting sites to explore. Some of the, they, they're taking time to dig into the secret escape tunnels that were dug by freedom fighters over the years. At some point, they dug out escape tunnels so they could get out of there if they needed to. It changed hands many different times. Yes, it started uh, with, uh, with King Herod, and it was a strategic point for him. But once he died, it changed hands, and the Romans came in, and then the rebels took it up, and, and, they, and they used it as a strategic point for, for them to base camp, to, to fight and push back against the Roman armies. It changed hands many different times after that as well. But it's one of the most exciting archaeology, uh, archaeological uh, locations that they are digging, that they are studying, that they are researching and spending time and money. And it was here in one of these caves, in one of these tunnels that they are exploring. Tucked away some 2,000 years ago, a jar of ancient seeds. Scientists begin to work with these seeds and after lying dormant for 2,000 
years in a dry, hot cave in a Judean desert just south of Jerusalem, these seeds begin to germinate and produce life. As we read here in Joel chapter 2, we read of a warning, the coming day of the Lord, terrible days that lie ahead, a warning for the day of the Lord is coming soon. Be ready. Be prepared. It's going to get dark. It's going to get gloomy. It's not going to be pretty. You're going to face all kinds of obstacles and trials and situations. A locust army, God was moving. He was using and moving it through the land, devouring everything in its sight, causing drought and famine and crippling the land and crippling growth and crippling progress. Remember, he, he wrote, he said, they're gonna, it's going to run uh, uh, to and fro in the city, and it shall run upon the walls and climb upon the houses and enter the windows like a thief, and the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon will be dark. It's going to be a dark day, and nobody is going to escape it. Who can escape it? Who can abide it? Who can escape the hand of the Lord? See, some of you feel like you have just gone through a dark and terrible day like the prophet Joel is explaining. Some of you might be, Sister Daniel, right in the middle of it. I'm in the middle of my storm. I'm in the middle of my darkness. What are you trying to say? I don't have any hope as it is. I just barely made it to service this morning. My gas tank's on E. They're trying to take my house. My kids are acting up. Your kids are always going to act up. Just, let's just be honest. And you're going through a terrible day of the Lord right now. It's a time in the desert, in the wilderness. Come on, we all go through dry times in our lives where everything seems hopeless. Dad is famous for saying, hey, if you're on top of a mountain, just give it six months. I mean, heard pastors say that before. Just give it six months. You're going to be in the valley. Don't be too hard on the people that are in the valley right now because you're going to be their neighbors here in six months. Right? Why? We all face life. We all face dry times. We all face times of darkness and despair and hopelessness and, and dryness. Life uh, uh, life is disappointing me. People are disappointing me. And what's the point of even trying this morning? That's why in Ecclesiastes, the writer says, in chapter 9, verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to us all, for men also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, or the birds that are caught in a snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon on them. You can't escape it. It's life. Darkness happens. Trials come. Guess what? Sickness comes. Disease comes to the just and to the unjust. It happens. It's hard. It's not fair. I'll say it again. It's not fair. We all deal with life and the troubles of life. No one is getting out of here alive. I don't know why we try so hard to get out of here alive. You have an expiration date. And when you get up in the morning and your knees are a little bit stiffer, moms, dads, Brother Felipe, I got a witness back there. Brother Felipe is witnessing right now. He knows what I'm preaching about. Your knees are a little bit stiffer. Your ankles are cracking as you're walking down the stairs. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. It's just a quick reminder, Brother George. You have an expiration date. There's a day coming. He didn't build you to live in this world forever. Stop trying to get out of here alive. It's not going to happen. We're all going to die. 
You know, they used to tell you people that drink milk live longer. Did you know that? Anybody ever hear that? You drink milk, you're going to live longer. Brother George, every person that I know that drank milk died. And that's a fact. You can take it to the bank. You're not going to get out of here alive. But while you are here, guess what? Life is going to happen. Trials, turmoil, pain, heartache, sickness, loss, it's going to happen. But listen to what Joel says next. Joel gives us a little bit of hope in the middle of a storm. Joel gives us something to hold on to when life is falling apart, when your joy is gone, when your hope is gone, when you're full of depression and despair and you just don't have anything to hold on to. Joel says, turn to the hills from which your strength coming from. Turn to the mountain. Turn to the mountain. Zion, turn, turn back to God. Let him be your comfort. Let him be your peace. Let him give you strength in the time of need. He says in verse chapter 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and mourning, and rent your heart, and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, and he is merciful, and he's slow to anger, and he's great in kindness, and repenteth him of all the evil. It is here where we are given a reminder that when we turn back to God, He is always there. He's never left us. He's not too far away from you right now. When our hearts are turned back to His, when, fa uh, when fasting is no longer just something that we talk about because it's the right thing to talk about, but we begin to participate in it. We begin to apply it to our lives. It becomes a, a daily ritual or a weekly ritual or monthly. We, we set, a time, time, set aside time to fast and to get a hold of God. Sister Sonia told me a couple weeks back that their group studied fasting and just got a hold of it. And they learned some principles and some concepts that their eyes were just open when it came to fasting. And, and they begin a, a weekly fast uh, uh, as a group where people are taking turns and one will fast one day and one will fast the next day and the next day and the next day. Why? Because when you turn your heart back to God and, and fasting becomes something a little bit more than just a, a good conversation, but it becomes, God, I want you more than anything this world can offer. And everything in my life says I should be down and in despair, but God, you are still there and I want you more than ever before. When we turn back, when we turn our hearts back, and once again, they begin to break for the same things that break his heart. When sin breaks your heart just like it breaks God's heart. You know what I'm saying? When you see somebody locked in bounds of sin and your heart goes out for them and you just want to say, look, there's a better way. There is hope. There is someone that cares and loves you. Even when life is down, even when it takes everything inside of you to pick your chin up, if you can just turn your focus back to him. You can turn your focus back to him. Does he quiet the storm immediately? Sometimes he does. Sometimes you're ne the next example of Job. But he didn't leave Job either. He didn't leave Job either. We were talking about it this morning about the faithful servant and, 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 and Joel. Joel could be described as a faithful servant, but I love the end of Joel. There's a verse, or Job, there's a verse that says this. It says, you know, now Job, Job fasted and, and Job sacrificed and he did all these things before, before he lost everything, before his kids died, before his cattle died, before all the despair that was brought his way. Job was a faithful servant. Bible says it. Have you considered my servant Job? Right? And at the end of the book of Job, you find in one of the last verses a verse that goes a little something like this. Before I had heard of you by my ears, but now have I seen you. He didn't leave Job alone. He didn't leave Job alone. 
He kept him. He kept him. God doesn't always quiet the storms immediately because sometimes he needs you to go through the storm. You've got some baggage on you. There's some, there's some things he needs to work out in your life. And if he takes you out of the storm and he quiets, you, quiets the storm around you, then what you need taken out of your life, what he needs to correct in your life, won't be corrected because he took you out of the storm. But just like a goldsmith, there's a process to purifying gold. You've got to go through the fire. You've got to go through some heat. You've got to go through some pressure. But what comes out on the other side is pure gold. It doesn't have the, the impurities in it anymore. It's been purified. So sometimes God's going to quiet a storm. But other times he's got to take you through the storm. And here's what it comes down to. You've got to stay focused on Him. All right, God, if I've got to go through this storm, Lord, I'm watching you. I'm following after you. I'm seeking after you. God, even when it hurts, even when the pressure's on, even when the heat's as hot as it can get, I'm focusing on you. Why? Because, God, you're the one that's still going to get me through this storm. And you say I need to go through it, so my trust is in you. And I'll go through it every step of the way if you will go with me. Noah had the right attitude. He said, up on the mountain, he said, God, if you want to take us there, take us there. But only take us there if you're going with us. Otherwise, you leave us right here in your presence. We want to stay right where you are. But God, if you'll go with me, then I will go. Needs to be your attitude this morning. Nothing can stop a child of God. No matter what he is calling you to do, if God goes with you, if you are seeking his will, if you are seeking his plan, there's no height, there's no limit to your life. But you've got to stay in his plan. You can't get frustrated with the process. Some of you have been praying, God, get me out of this trial. Anybody ever prayed that? How many want to be, I want to be transparent this morning? God, just get me out of this. I don't want to take it. I don't want to deal with it. You pray, go ahead, raise them high. Raise them real high. Everybody that's prayed that prayer before, look around. Look around. You see? You're not alone. You're not the only one that's prayed that prayer. But let's change your prayer a little bit. You need to be praying, God, chisel away the parts of me that are keeping me from you. Whatever it is that you need to get out of this trial, I'll go through the trial. I'll go through this situation. But God, I just pray that you do the work that you need done in my life. I'll, I, if you'll just do the work, I'll follow after you. Watch, even Jesus said, if this cup can pass from me. But what was the end of his prayer? Nevertheless, God. Nevertheless, God, if I've got to go through to a cross, I'll go to a cross for your will to be done in my life. So we find the end of Joel chapter 2, a promise of blessing at verse number 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years... That were stolen and ye shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed what am I preaching this morning after 2,000 years and all the hurt and the trials and the dry times God is still able to bring life from the dirt again see it doesn't matter how long you've 
been down. It doesn't not matter how matter how long the uh, the dryness has been there. It doesn't matter how hopeless it's been. There is life in the rubble that God can draw out. There are seeds that were planted in you many, many, many years ago, and you've been going through dry times, and you've been going through hard times and trials and situations. But listen, God's the one that can reach down and pick one of those seeds up and germinate it and life begin to spring up again life can spring up again ancient seeds deep in your soul waiting for God to do the work in your life waiting for you to make it through the trial just hold on a little bit more just turn your focus to God a little bit more just focus on him add some fasting add some prayer add some Bible reading focus in on God and watch the life that begins to germinate out of your walk with him these date palm trees are the oldest seeds to have ever been germinated The oldest seeds to ever been germinated. They say the dates that come off of them are larger than what our current dates are that we see. They're sweeter than our current dates. Listen, when you allow God to control your life, when you allow God to control your future, when you say, God, I want you more than anything else we were talking about it in class talking about Joseph and how Joseph was once again the faithful servant and God began to remind me and I shared it with the kids but he reminded me of how Joseph it didn't matter the situation he was going through his character never changed mom why because he was a servant to the king and you see, it's the same thing with you. And it's the same thing with your trial. It doesn't matter the situation that you're in. The trial, the dryness, the desert, the jail, the prison, the, the, uh, the servant, and the, uh, being a house and the uh, servant in the house of, of a master. It doesn't matter what position. If your character stays the same, if your focus is still on God and, and your heart is still turned towards Him, God's going to bless you through the whole process. Through the whole process, seeds and life. Life and, and are going to germinate and you're going to make it and you will be more blessed at the end than you ever were at the beginning Job was blessed it was multiplied but you got to keep your focus on God you got to stay focused on his plan and his will for your life God gave you a promise. God gave you instructions. God said, I want to use you in this area. You need to hold on to it. You need to begin to seek it, to fulfill it, that God can fulfill it in your life. The oldest seeds to ever be germinated. They sat there for 2,000 years in one of those caves. The heat of a desert sun, the dryness. One scientist that was in, involved in this process believes that it was the dryness, listen to this, it was the dryness and it was the heat that helped preserve the seeds for so long. It's the storm that helps preserve some of the things in your life that helps prepare some of the things in your life that God wants to do. See, it's a trial that helps shape and mold you into what God wants you to be. God, too, can use dry times to preserve the seeds that are in your life. But you've got to stay focused on Him. I'm closing. Mom, why don't you come? Why don't you stand this morning? You need to be praying, Thy will, God, for my life thy will in everything that I do everything that I put my hands to listen group leaders listen to me you need to be praying thy will be done in my group tonight my thy will be done in my in my uh, 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 the, the people attending my group God I need your your will to be done in their life God anoint my mouth that your that your voice would come out that your word would come out that your purpose would come out that they would receive it 
and it would help change their life and it would help take them forward and it would help minister to them in a deeper way than I as a group leader ever could God God thy will be done thy will be done and listen I want you to understand something God's timing is more important than your timing God's timing is more important than your timing any day all day any week all week God's timing is more important there's a story I've shared it many times with many different young ministers when talking about the timing of God there was a pastor there was a man that was called to a city God knew, it, or the man knew it was the voice of God calling him to the city to, to pastor. And, and he just had this heavy burden for the people of that city, for the loss of that city. Because when God begins to put a burden and call you to a ministry or to a place, there's a heavy burden that comes over you for the loss, for the dying of that, of that city. And this man went to the district, the organization of, the, of that state and said, I want to go to this city. God is calling me to this city. I, 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 I want permission to go and, and start a work. And, and at the time that he went, he was told, no, not yet. And it weighed on him. It weighed on him. Because understand, sometimes waiting is a storm in itself. Waiting on a promise that God has given you. Waiting on a promise. Waiting on God's hand to move. God, I'm here. I'm ready. Just do your will. And God's sitting there waiting. And it's almost, the silence can almost be deafening. God, I just need, I just need to hear from you, God. Did you really call me? Did you really tell me I'm supposed to do this? God, is that voice that I heard, was it real? Or is it just in the back of my mind? And it's deafening sometimes, the silence. So he went back to the board, he went back to the organization a couple, couple months later and said, listen, listen, I've heard the voice of God. I know it was his voice. He's calling me to plant a church, to do a work in this city. He was told to wait. And in the trial, in the desert, in the dry times, in the quiet times, doubt and frustration began to build up in his life. And finally, he walked in the next meeting and turned in his minister card and said, well, you guys are obviously aren't following the voice of God because he's called me to this city. And so he turns his, in his ministerial license and, and no longer with that organization. But you know what? Here's the problem. What he didn't know was that there was a pastor scheduled to resign a church of 300 people and he was the right man for the job and God was calling him and God was preparing him and God was putting that burden upon him to begin to pray but he got frustrated in the waiting and in the time but listen God's timing is more important than your timing and if he gave you a promise you can still hold on to it let me tell you another story He's a young minister, and he was searching out the will and the call of God's life, uh, for his life. He went into the city, and he felt a burden for the city, and he prayed a prayer. And he said, he saw a house up for sale, and he said, God, if it is your will for me to come to this city and start a church, he said, that house up on that hill, don't let it sell simple prayer he's looking for a confirmation hey you guys have prayed the, those prayers for confirmation too haven't you you're not the only ones we find it in the Bible Gideon prayed a couple times for a couple different confirmations to make sure he heard the voice of God pray to prayer God don't let that house sell if it's your will and your plan for me to come to the city and 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 start a church start a work don't let that house sell and let me tell you that was 10 years ago that I heard that story and last time I heard 
that a house was still on the market. But here's the problem. That young man and his wife are still sitting where they were before when they prayed the prayer. I said, God, if it's your will, understand sometimes you need to put into action. You need to take some steps too. God said, I'm going to hold a house hostage if if it means confirming some things to you. But you've got to be willing to step out when he says to go. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter how long you've been going through it. God's plan and his promises are still true. It doesn't matter how, how quiet it seems like it's been. God, where are you in my trial? Where are you in my situation? Did you forget about your servant? 2,000 years went by and then life came. We don't get to determine or pick or choose how long a trial goes. But Joel reminded us, keep your eyes focused on God. Keep your heart turned to the things of God. Keep fasting and praying. Keep your heart right. Keep your attitude right. And what happens in the end You will not be able to count the blessings that God gives you, the plans that he has for you, the success that he has for you, the revivals that come from your ministry of ministering to your neighbors and your family and your friends and your co-workers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The impact that could come from your walk if you stay focused on him. Amen. Amen. I I, I guess I did go a little bit late. Amen. Why don't we take just a moment right where you're at. I wonder if you would just respond to the word of God this morning. Hallelujah. He met us here in such a special way. I wonder if you couldn't just respond to, to his meeting us here this morning with a rededication to God. I will turn my heart to you, God. I will focus my eyes on you, God. No matter how big the waves are, no matter how strong the wind is, Lord, no matter how loud the howling of the wind is, God, my focus will be on you, God. It will only be on you, God. Lord, because I want your will above my will. I want your ways above my ways, God. I want your purpose and your plan above anything that I could try to achieve. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody connect with Jesus Christ right now. Don't let it be another sermon that passes you by, but let it challenge your soul. Let it challenge your heart to do His will, to hold on a little bit longer in your storm, to turn your focus from the waves back to Him. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. If you want to come to this altar, you can. If you want to turn around in your seat, you can. But take a moment. Take some time. Connect with Jesus. His plans and His purpose are not void. They don't don't return void. But He's got plans and purposes for your life. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus.
the youth department of the state of Colorado in prayer this week. Amen. That God would minister and touch the lives of our young people. Amen. Amen. We also want to pray. I forgot. Sister Johnson had texted me. She is uh, traveling to Indiana. She's actually already there. I think she's coming back tomorrow uh, going out for a funeral. But let's keep her in prayer as well as she travels. Amen. Perez family is going on vacation. Amen. I have asked for prayer. Let's pray for these couple needs. Jesus, Lord, you see Sister Johnson as she's traveling to that funeral, God. Lord, I pray that you would keep your hand of protection upon her, Lord, that you would minister to that family, God. Have your way this morning, Jesus. Lord, we pray for the Perez family that you would keep your hand upon them as they travel, as they take some time for vacation. God, I pray that you would be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. You are dismissed.